have <coughs> three interesting panelists and also an interesting panel. I think uh, almost everyone knows what is, what is cryptocurrency or at least heard of it. Who doesn't know? Raise your hand. No. Everyone knows. And uh, another thing is that we want to touch why we need the, to uh, get away with these traditional financial services and make it more user friendly. Um, please allow me to introduce uh, our panelists. Uh, Dr. Bithiek is um, head of uh, security is in Malta's financial regulator, financial regulator. And as I believe it is a mega regulator, regulates uh, almost uh, uh, every aspect of financial services in Malta. Malta is uh, one of the first jurisdictions in the world uh, which introduced this uh, um, alternative finance uh, related initiatives. And uh, we have uh, honored uh, partner, friend, Eric uh, Larchewek, if I pronounce. Perfect. Good. So my French lessons were good. Uh, Ledger is, uh, is a pioneer firm in crypto security, I may say like this. Yeah. Cyber uh, security, not security is in the financial yes. term. <laughs> yes. We are not regulated yet. <laughs> and uh, you, you recently, no, were all your funding is above 80 million dollars, something like that. This is what we know. And uh, it's one of the fastest growing companies in, uh, in uh, cyber security field. And uh, then we have a guest uh, from Brazil, Marciano Testa. Welcome. Um, uh, we, we, couldn't, we couldn't see you yesterday, but uh, finally we reached uh, on time. And Adjubank, if I spell correctly everything and say pronounce everything, okay. yeah? Uh, Adjubank is uh, one of the biggest digital banks, I may say, in the world. Uh, Comparing the size, the number of employees, uh, and uh, the way you sh shape uh, financial services in Latin America, so it is basically an app. You will talk uh, yourself more on that. And uh, so, uh, allow me to start uh, with uh, uh, Mr. Testa. My first question: What does make a bank different in growing fintech area? So, uh, bom dia a todos. Um, uh, you need to uh, put a uh, headset, please. Because it's better for you, I'm speaking Portuguese. Na verdade, o Agibank, ele é um, uma evolução de uma fintech que eu fundei há mais ou menos 12, 13 anos atrás. Consiste numa operação uh, de banco completo no Brasil que usa a estratégia omnichannel, ou seja, ela combina uma plataforma digital closed looping, completa, um portfólio completo de produtos de financeiros e uma estratégia de distribuição por uma rede de, de touch points, né, que nós chamamos, não são agências uh, grandes, são pontos de contatos para assessorar os clientes. São 600 pontos que nós temos no Brasil. É, falando de Brasil e de América Latina, é, essa combinação omnichannel faz todo, toda a diferença, porque o onboarding das contas ele se dá de uma forma mais rápida e também o cross-selling de produtos. Isso faz do Agibank é, ser um diferencial e ser uma operação extremamente rentável, diferente dos outros bancos digitais que a gente vê no mundo. Né? O Washbank ele tem hoje um retorno de em média 40% de ROI anual, porque justamente nós conseguimos uma penetração maior de produtos nos nossos clientes. Uh, nós estamos com uma estratégia global agora, iniciamos uma operação nos Estados Unidos. O nosso grande diferencial é que o número do celular é, é o número da conta corrente. Isso permite um peer-to-peer -peer a nível global. Uh, nós estamos faseando essa, essa etapa de, de evolução. E, 
esse é um pouco do que, do que nós fizemos. Nós temos hoje mais de um milhão e meio de clientes já na nossa base, ativos, uh, e nós recebemos por mês em torno de 250 mil novos pedidos de clientes e aprovamos algo como 100 mil clientes novos por mês. Então é um crescimento exponencial aí de quase 10% da base uh, mensalmente. Então esse é um pouco do que nós fizemos lá no Brasil. Thank you very much. Very insightful. Uh, we'll have uh, questions, uh, ongoing questions, in the next uh, in minutes. But uh, my, my my another question is uh, to uh, Eric, and I would like us to ask about how did you start Ledger, and uh, what is the concept basically? Why why do we need to, to have a Ledger if we we have a cryptocurrency like I have a Bitcoin? Why do I need it? Actually, just for information, Ledger um, uh, gave us few devices, uh, and maybe we can we can show during the day if someone asks or or interested in. Yeah, um, of course. So um, by background, I'm an engineer in microelectronics and an entrepreneur. I have done a few a few startup. My first was in '96, so it's more than 20 like 20 years ago. Uh, and after a few adventures, uh, I discovered Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, in 2013. Uh, and I was immediately uh, charmed by the technology. I understood that it would change the society as we know it. Internet changed the way that we communicate. Blockchain technology is going to change the way that we exchange uh, values. Um, and when you own cryptocurrencies, when you own Bitcoin, as it is a fully decentralized system, uh, you really own the assets. We, we know that we hear about virtual currencies and we think it's in the cloud, or, but in fact it's very physical because owning a, f a cryptocurrency asset is owning an information. We call that a private key, but basically it's a bearer bond. Whoever knows this information, which is a series of zeros and one, as access to the assets. And so you need to keep them secure. And in France, we have a long tradition of the smart card industry, you know, the secure hardware. Um, you will find that in your chip and pin credit card, in your passport. Uh, this technology has been used to uh, secure secrets. Uh, and France has 40 years of experience into this industry. And so, uh, one of my co-founders was coming from this industry and we really saw that the need for security in cryptocurrencies in the sense that if you buy uh, physical gold, you are going to buy a safe because you own something and you need to secure it. Mm -hmm. If you buy Bitcoin, you will own an information and you need to secure it. You cannot have it on your computer or your smartphone because they have not been designed for security and we all know that they can be hacked very easily. So you need to protect them into a digital safe. And this is how we came to build what we call now hardware wallet, a physical wallet, which basically holds securely the private keys, the bearer bond, and keep them in isolation. So uh, our hardware wallet has been quite successful. We have sold to about 1.5 million units in 165 countries. And our customers are individuals who hold cryptocurrencies and want to secure. So to answer your question, if you have Bitcoin, you need a safe, digital safe. And Ledger coming from the smart card industry has all the technology to bring the highest level of security. Thank you very much. I I remember once I was hearing uh, one of the industry leaders, uh, Binance founder, uh, he was talking about, I have, I have uh, no employees, I have uh, uh, no bank account, I have no formation, but uh, we have users from uh, 180 countries, something like that. Uh, Coming to that, um, my question is to Dr. Butujiek. Uh, so Malta has always been uh, surprising us in terms of uh, innovation in financial industry. And what, my question is, what are you looking for? What, how do you see uh, the future and how do you follow? Or maybe you heard from entrepreneurs and then follow the idea or you create something 
then entrepreneurs come to you? Um, the government of Malta decided um, around two years ago that it wanted to uh, have a, ter a fourth pillar of, it, of the economy. Um, Malta's economy is largely based on uh, um, financial services, gaming, and other services sector, and the government decided it wanted the fourth pillar. The fourth pillar um, was going to uh, focus, and this is focusing on technology. Mm -hmm. Um, an effort, uh, the government set up a task force. The task force came up with a proposal uh, which focused very much on DLT and blockchain. And uh, as a result, uh, there was a push by the industry to attract these companies to come and operate in Malta. Um, I come from the financial regulator, as you mentioned. And our role is to ensure that there's proper investor protection, market integrity, and financial soundness. Um, in the industry. And as a result, once we started seeing um, companies coming to Malta to launch ICOs and also to establish exchanges, the uh, government and, and the MFSA agreed that there uh, was a need for regulation in this field. And uh, I was asked at the MFSA by the Board of Governors to come up with a framework for the regulation of this area. Um, the Regulation is a mechanism to achieve trust in a, an industry. Um, we've all experienced the financial crisis. As a result of the financial crisis, policymakers decided to uh, strengthen even further regulation, to strengthen financial supervision. And the reason is that regulation and supervision give trust to investors. Investors are protected through regulation and supervision. Markets are, are sound through regulation and supervision. And as a result, there is more confidence in the market. And uh, this is, um, these are the objectives we're trying to achieve through our regulatory framework. We came, up, we came up with a framework which regulates all the areas in this field. So whether you are launching an ICO, or whether you're establishing an exchange, or whether you're providing custody for crypto assets, um, we have a framework which applies to all these operators. Um, again, the framework is set up in a way which addresses the, the, the uh, risks in this field, and uh, there are um, three main risks that we are trying to address. Uh, number one, the at risk relating to uh, money laundering, which is high on the agenda in this area. Um, FATF, which is the Financial Action Task Force, which is an international standard setting body in this field, has emphasized a lot on standards on anti-money laundering for this field. Um, we have also um, tried through the framework to address issues of transparency. Again, ICOs um, have issued white papers um, and disclaimed out there that they are not sufficiently transparent on what they're trying to achieve through the ICO and how investors will be compensated after the ICO is made. And then the issue of um, cyber risk, mm -hmm. um, which is very important. You've all heard of the, the um, hacks that happened on Japanese exchanges and the, the, the significant amount of um, uh, virtual currencies and crypto assets that have been managed to, uh, um, being to, to, manage to, to, these hackers managed to steal as a result of this hacking. So we are focusing on, to address these three main risks. And we are doing so through um, high level principles that you find in, generally in financial regulation. Mm. So uh, we've got a framework for transparency where ICOs are required to, to be transparent with investors and we will be vetting their white papers to ensure that there's a, a certain degree of transparency in relation both to the objectives, the governance, and also uh, the milestones that the ICO um, is, is to achieve. Um, we've also introduced requirements for the license holders, meaning exchanges and wallet providers and other types of license holders. Again, based on, on high level principles, you'll find in traditional financial services law. So requirements on governance, requirements on compliance function, requirements on risk management, requirements on prudential and capital, and also requirements on conduct. Um, we are being very um, prudent 
in the sense we have said on a number of occasions to the um, industry that uh, we are going to set the bar high and we want only um, industry players of a certain standard. And um, as a result, um, we are pushing now to uh, make sure that the applicants that are going to apply to the MFSA, and there are a significant amount of applicants, um, the, the law came into force on the 1st of November, um, so last week, and uh, we, we've received so far around 1,000 notifications by industry um, uh, participants that want to uh, be regulated under our framework. We are still going through these notifications. Um, these are notifications for the transitional period. So there's, it's a period where you can operate in the jurisdiction uh, without a license, and it gives you space to come up to, to come up to speed with regulation before applying. And uh, it, we are we are making sure that that the people that come in are are of the right standard. Um, one final point that I'd like to make. It's good that we've got a, a representative of the banking sector. Um, without um, the banks, the sector won't be able to grow. Um, and the banks, at least at, on, on a European scale, are, being, um, uh, are still being very cautious in relation to this area. And we believe that the solution is regulation. Regulation will give confidence to the banks to start looking more uh, to this field and allowing um, these industry participants to, to come in and, and get, the required, um, get the required bank accounts to be able to carry out transactions. Yeah, thank you very much for this detailed note. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Testa if you have uh, any ideas about cryptocurrency and LATAM market? What are the negative and positive uh, things you have seen or uh, you're observing it now? Mm, yeah. What is something in your mind? Eu acho que a colocação do colega aqui foi foi muito boa. Uh, dificilmente o uh, Bitcoin, no formato que ele está estruturado hoje, ele deverá ser uma moeda global mas ele criou um precedente. É, ele mostrou que é sim possível fazer transferências de recursos de forma é, segura, rápida, online. Uh, com isso, é, eu pego até como exemplo um, algo que a gente está desenvolvendo lá num grupo de seis bancos no Brasil, com apoio do Banco Central, criando uma, uma câmara de liquidação de, através de blockchain, né, estruturada na tecnologia de blockchain nativo, começando do zero isso. É, onde nós podemos fazer transferências de dinheiro entre o sistema bancário brasileiro, peer-to-peer, -peer, né, 24 por 7, sem utilização de cartão de crédito, adquirência, etc. Mas extremamente regulado. É, o conceito que eu defendo muito de uma moeda global, é, nós criamos alguns anos atrás para sair lá da, da hiperinflação no Brasil, o, uma unidade que se chama R, URV, Unidade Relativa de Valor. Então você imagina ter uma unidade relativa de valor global, que ela tem uma, um câmbio com cada moeda de cada país e essa unidade relativa ser lastreada em blockchain. Hoje a gente vê todos os países que têm algum tipo de ditadura, como Venezuela, é, Cuba, são os países que mais utilizam né, o, 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 o blockchain. O, a criptomoeda, né, como as que estão mais em utilização, como o Ethereum e, e o Bitcoin, justamente porque ela dá liberdade para as pessoas terem acesso né, aos seus recursos, principalmente num governo ditador. Isso mostra que tem um precedente de utilização, mas a forma como ela está estruturada, nós entendemos que tem aí um caminho é, importante, regulatório, para que se tenha confiança e se combate a todos os crimes e etc que, que a moeda acaba fomentando. Então tem, tem um caminho muito longo pela frente, mas ela abriu um grande precedente. Eu acho que esse é o, é o que a gente defende lá. E nós estamos envolvidos nessa, nessa construção agora dessa primeira plataforma né, estruturada em blockchain para fazer essa transferência em reais né, e depois, quem sabe, outras moedas. Thank you very much. Uh, really interesting. Uh, I I would like uh, to ask a question, uh, but a uh, ledger. Uh, 
take, I'm an, an average investor, and uh, I don't know anything um, like detailed about cryptocurrency. How should I compare um, security of these digital currencies? So say I hold uh, Ethereum or I hold, I don't know, something else that you know, or Bitcoin. How should I compare uh, the security level of uh, these uh, cryptocurrencies? Maybe with your technology or, be, or maybe there is something that we don't have it yet. Maybe it will be in the future. You mean compare compare to what, to fiat currencies? Or uh, like, like I I mean just any currency. Like uh, you are sure that no one will grab it from your account. Yes. Well, there is a big question that, or it's also about trust. You know, because what does it has value? Uh, that's like the biggest question people can ask when they see uh, Bitcoin, for instance. Why does it have even some value? Um, and it goes to, indeed, the notion of, uh, of trust. Uh, today, uh, so to understand why Bitcoin has value, you first need to understand why, for instance, gold has value. Uh, because you could say that Bitcoin is not backed by anything. So what gold is backed uh, upon? Um, it's, it's, it has value because gold, as a metal, has unique properties such as it's difficult to counterfeit, um, it is uh, in a way easy to transport, it is scarce, and there is this, uh, let's say, this legacy, uh, this tradition of uh, using it for centuries as a way of exchange. Um, Bitcoin is basically trying to be digital gold in a fully decentralized way. And if it has some value, if people trust it, it's because it has demonstrated its capacity to exchange uh, values, uh, which are denominated into Bitcoin units, uh, with a full resistance to, to hack and uh, censorship. I'm not talking about the, the hacks uh, related to the endpoints, such as Mongox, the Japanese, I, I will come quickly to that. But it derives its value to the fact that it works and you can safely exchange units in Bitcoin from A to B without any central authority and despite all tentatives to control or, or hack it. Um, and so as it works well as a means of exchange, it has some value because uh, I would say users or holders uh, see some future value in it. Of course, there is speculation. So what is the real value of Bitcoin? No one knows, but it derives its value from the fact that uh, there is a limited amount of Bitcoin and you can safely uh, exchange them. If you have the question, you could ask the question, then why do I cannot myself create a new Bitcoin and why maybe it would have value? Uh, because there is also other cryptocurrencies, there is Ethereum, etc. There are like thousands of cryptocurrencies. So why, uh, if I create tomorrow a new Bitcoin, why should it have value? You can think about it as a social network. You have Facebook, but you also have Twitter, you have LinkedIn, you have Baidu in China, uh, you have local social networks, and they all have these specific values. And it's the same for cryptocurrencies. If tomorrow you create another Bitcoin, you need to convince people to use it. You need to have this network effect. And for instance, Bitcoin is seen as a digital gold. Ethereum is seen more as a framework to build these ICOs. Uh, and so on. Um, and finally, regarding the, let's say, endpoint security, uh, which is a very uh, strong uh, question, because if you own something, you want to make sure that it's not going to disappear overnight. Um, well, if you decide to own cryptocurrencies, as I was saying, you are really going to own something, or you can delegate that to exchanges, uh, which are marketplaces. And if this marketplace get hacked, you will lose everything because there is no uh, insurance or nothing. That's why regulation of these mm. central marketplaces is so important. And that's why in Malta, uh, regulation will require a very strong, uh, let's say, focus on cyber security. Um, and so uh, technology, cyber security plays a very strong role in that. And I think that is why uh, our products, and generally speaking, security products, because we are not the only one to, to do that, has been so popular. Uh, because 
uh, users understood the notion that they need to secure their assets. Mm -hmm. And we are in a world uh, when it's about digital security where it's not easy to understand what you do. And so it's easier to just use uh, tools that have been designed just, uh, just for that. If Great. I may, if I may add. Yes, I, I would ask this question. Yeah, go ahead. In what we're doing in relation to cybersecurity is we've set up a, a new uh, agency, um, the Malta Digital Innovation Authority. Um, the authority um, approves systems auditors and also um, certifies DLT technology. Uh, it, it's a new authority. It, it, it was established on the 1st of November as part of the efforts by the government to uh, make Malta a, a secure place to have um, technology and technology sector on the island. And the systems auditors uh, will be required as part of the application process for an ICO or an exchange to assess the technology of these companies, amongst other things, um, whether they satisfy the, the authority standards, the MFSA standards on cybersecurity, which we are about to launch in, in the coming weeks. Um, so the, the, the framework covers not only traditional way how to regulate um, the area of financial services through disclosure, governance, uh, conduct and prudential regulation, but also covers the area of technology. Um, where we will be getting these opinions from approved systems auditors and that will give us comfort that uh, the technology is safe and that investors um, can invest in this technology uh, in a way which, which doesn't um, uh, result in, in, in their detriment. Um, so again, what you're saying is music to my ears. I mean, we've been in pushing for cyber security uh, for the past year since we've started this project. We also organized a conference in September uh, where we brought um, cyber security companies to Malta to, to uh, give presentations to the industry, um, uh, where we also had the opportunity to interact with the Cyber Defense Alliance, probably you're familiar with them. They are based in London and they bring together a number of banks which have been working very actively on the area of cyber security. So uh, yes, all you're saying is, is very important and I think is key um, to achieve confidence in this field. Um, as I mentioned before, cyber security is one of the elephants in the room. We need to deal with it if we want this, the, this industry to grow in a sustainable way and if we want to have confidence in this area. Thank you. Uh, I want to, just uh, to ask uh, if the audience has uh, any question. Like we can take one question, then final remarks, if you allow, because of time is running very fast. Is there any question from the audience? If not, I would continue uh, asking final ones. Uh, so, going uh, back to Brazil, uh, Mr. Testa, how do you see the future of banking? É uma boa pergunta. Eu acho que o que nós enxergamos lá de forma global existe uma corrida tecnológica. O Brasil não está fora disso. Uh, várias fintechs, uh, várias startups que aí reúnem um ecossistema tanto de cyber security e tudo mais, podendo, uh, captando recursos né, de forma muito ostensiva. Eu acabei de vir agora do, do Vale do Silício e lá a gente vê um movimento muito forte nesse sentido. Uh, o próprio Brasil, que era um país que não atraía né, investimentos globais, Hoje, eh, as fintechs estão recebendo aportes mensalmente, eh, é anunciado um novo aporte lá na, na, nas fintechs. Tudo isso porque existe uma corrida tecnológica para ver quem é o banco que oferece o melhor produto, a melhor experiência, a melhor segurança, né? uh, ou seja, um serviço AAA a baixo custo. Né? Essa é a grande proposta das plataformas dos bancos digitais. Muito difícil equilibrar isso, é um grande desafio, acho que esse é o maior desafio das fintechs e dos bancos digitais, porque as fintechs, elas começam a trabalhar nas bordas, né, onde os serviços são menos complexos e a baixa barreira de entrada, como payments, 
Depois vão para as, as estruturas de investimentos, seguros, lending, empréstimos, até chegar no core banking, que é de fato ter um portfólio completo. Esse caminho, ele ainda é um caminho longo a ser trilhado, porque os bancos têm muito capital, os grandes bancos. Então, você fazer o um investimento para conseguir ter mais velocidade e fazer uma oferta diferenciada, necessita também de muito, muito capital, muito investimento. Então, esse eu acho que é o principal desafio das fintechs e dos bancos digitais a nível global. Uh, mas nós estamos muito entusiasmados porque o cliente está muito é, receptivo. Né? O cliente cansou de ficar refém de quatro, cinco grandes bancos num país e pagar taxas é, elevadas para se manter uma conta corrente. Então, gente, nós estamos bem animados, mas é um desafio realmente uh, grande conseguir gerar essa melhor experiência pelo menor custo e ser rentável. Eu só queria aqui comentar, um, um, fazer um último comentário sobre os bitcoins, é, discordar um pouco aqui do colega, eu acho que toda a questão de, da segurança, é, sem sombra de dúvida, é, faz todo sentido, mas é a questão do impor valor a uma moeda. Né? Se ela tem o objetivo de ser um meio de pagamento, que é o que o bitcoin se, propor, se propõe a ser, é, ele não devia ter valor de asset, né? de investimento como um ativo. Então, acho que teve uma distorção é, de, de visão em relação ao que é o, o propósito do, do Bitcoin ou das criptomoedas. Por isso que eu acredito muito nessa unidade de valor, ou seja, você tem uma unidade de valor global que transaciona ou tem algum tipo de câmbio com cada moeda de cada país e essa unidade de valor ser é, toda ela baseada em, Bitcoin, em, em, em blockchain né, para garantir a segurança. Quando você atrela valor a uma moeda, aí ela realmente é, ela, ela teve uma distorção porque a gente não considera o Bitcoin um ativo. Só um, um ponto de vista aqui da minha visão em relação a isso. Muito obrigado. So, I want to ask final remarks uh, to both of you. First is uh, Dr. Butidiak. What could you do for fintech entrepreneurs like uh, Mr. Testa or like Eric uh, in uh, cybersecurity, uh, providing cybersecurity solutions for f uh, financial firms, basically, or uh, ICO-related transactions? What What do you think regulators could do? But still, because of uh, international push, etc., they don't do it. Um, I think what regulators do is primarily protect protect investors and and also making sure that markets are fair, efficient, and transparent. Um, but by so doing, they give confidence in a system. Mm -hmm. So um, we in Malta, together with France, because France is also pushing a lot in this field have created our own regimes, national regimes, um, for crypto assets and uh, for exchanges of crypto assets. Um, however, doing um, national regimes is not enough. Um, there needs to be a, a, an international standards in this field. Because unless we've got international standards, unless we've got mutual recognition between regulators, Um, in this area, there, there's always going to be um, what is known as barriers to cross-border business. So in, at European level, we need a European initiative. And there is debate about a possible European initiative in the field of crypto assets. And there, there is a, a working group within the EBA, the European Banking Authority, and the European Securities and Markets Authority, Uh, both have their working groups that will be issuing reports, hopefully before the end of this year, making recommendations to the European Commission. Um, eventually, uh, the European Commission uh, is likely to make a proposal. Make a proposal for the regulation of this field, where this field of business is also provided with a passport, uh, meaning allowing cross-border business. And that is fundamental for this industry to grow. 
because unless there is a passport, there are going to be barriers to cross-border business. There are going to be different interpretations of what a crypto asset is, whether it should fall under traditional financial services law or whether it should fall under a, 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 a sui generis uh, piece of legislation and uh, at national level. And therefore, it is likely that we will have, unfortunately, confusion. So uh, the push that both the industry and regulators like us should be doing at this stage, and this is what we are doing, uh, together with, with our French counterparts, is push for a, a European approach, a European directive or a European regulation in this field, and uh, also for international standards in this area. Because ultimately this business is international. Um, anyone can access an exchange from anywhere in the world, and anyone can transact on these exchanges. And it would be a pity that if, if because of lack of international standards, uh, this business would result in, in uh, b uh, barriers to its, to its further development. Thank you. And uh, my last question to Eric is about uh, in cybersecurity, especially in financial services, what separates us from ideal cybersecurity system in financial services? We have seen a lot of uh, problems, hacks, uh, you know, banker network, something happened in Japan. So a lot of things we have seen like that. So this audience, they want to be secure. And they probably they want something that seems ideal, but, but technology doesn't allow it. Can you say like one point or two points uh, with how do you see fin ideal uh, cybersecurity uh, for financial services? Well, for at least cryptocurrency-based financial services, uh, everything is related to what we call secure hardware, which is a specific subset of the hardware. When you are thinking about computers or microprocessors, you have two sets. You have what you will find in your remote controller, a kettle, a microwave. This is generic <coughs> microprocessors and you have what you will find into passport, credit cards, SIM cards, and which is secure hardware. And uh, so the answer lies into developing technology which is based on secure hardware, which is the only hardware which has all the features to resist uh, reverse engineering, uh, opening of the chip, because we are talking about bare bones, like physical things, it's information. And people can really go up to taking the chips and trying to laser to decay them. And so you need the highest level of security because you may have billions in values in some computers and you cannot revoke, contrary to classical financial services where you can always do something. So having the highest level of technology based on secure hardware is the only uh, option. And it raises a lot the bar of this security world because now you really need to have security systems that can withstand the highest level of attacks. And so it's a very good, uh, let's say, use case uh, for secure hardware. And so vendors that we know in secure hardware like Thales, uh, Idemia, Gemalto, you know, big European companies in cybersecurity and secure hardware are really challenged uh, onto this point. So it's, it's a great future, I would say, for uh, secure hardware. Thank you very much. I would like to thank to uh, all of our panelists, and uh, yeah, please give. I think Eric would. Thank you. I think Eric, Eric would uh, himself uh, deliver this gifts as. Uh, yeah, it consists uh, of uh, ledger like, devices. Uh, one of our products. Uh, happy to. Uh, <laughs> to yeah, thank you very much.